What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mehran Podcast. Today's episode is part two of my discussion with Tom Wallish. The podcast is now on Patreon, which provides a great way for the listeners to help support the podcast. With your support as patrons, you'll be entered in exclusive monthly raffles this season, as well as getting shout outs in the podcast, seeing behind the scenes, and even getting the chance to have a question asked to guests. Your support helps out a ton, so check it out at patreon.com slash the Mehran Podcast. So with that said, big shout out to Will Cameron. First patron on Patreon. Thanks for your support, bro. So for the second part of our discussion, we talked some more about his new movie, Fresh Squeezed. We talked about X Games Real Ski Contest and its evolution through the years. We also talked about putting on his own rail jump competition, the current state of competitions in free ski, and much, much more. Again, it was super cool talking with Tom, and I hope you enjoy it. Big shout out to this episode's sponsors, Daymaker Touring, Axis Board Shop, and Planks Clothing. Let's go. You talked about being around people that are motivated and hungry and like just excited. How was it this winter going on a street trip with a guy, I guess he's around your age, LJ Strenio, who seems like the un one of the hungriest guy I've ever seen. Like he always looks like super motivated. Oh yeah. It was so cool. So LJ and I have like skied together so much and, and filmed together a ton, but ironically enough, like almost never filmed urban together like we've you know lived together traveled together competed together filmed backcountry park everything but like never really been on a street trip together and we always joke because we'd be on trips with different people and like L lj would be on a trip with will who's so focused will wesson who's so focused on finding like the perfect spot and i'd be on a a trip with Say somebody like Phil too, who like is so determined on finding the perfect spot, getting the perfect trick. And me and LJ were always like, I don't know, dude, there's a fucking rail. Let's go do a crazy trick on this rail. Like who cares? Like we're just like both like these like way too ADD, hungry, antsy, down to try any feature, try any trick, get a trick on this, like go for it, like type skiers. And we we're like, we should just go on the same trip. And then we'll just both always be like itching to ski and still it was hilarious this year with both of us like 33 and 30 i guess maybe we're both yeah 33 34 and we're like just yeah that's a rail we should try that and we brought along hilariously enough this other kid tucker Fitzsimons, who's like the younger version of probably lj like we'll hit any rail we'll do a more technical trick than we want to do so he inevitably like gets the shot over us and it's just like Man, is that what we were like when we were young? This is infuriating. This kid is too good, too motivated, won't stop, never gets tired, and is also like more technical than us. Like shit. But as a group of three, it was it was really cool. It was really fun to to be with LJ and to like work hard. We you know hustled that trip so hard and and still like pick and choose features and like hit certain things. But it was just fun to to have no pressure. Like really, we're we're trying to get shots, but LJ's you know basically getting ready to like focus full time on on real life and real school and, and getting a real job. And I'm just like so happy to find new features. And it doesn't need to be the hardest trick. I'm just always looking for new features. So we were really in just such a good mindset and just basically letting this kid Tucker run after anything. Like ah, there's a down rail. Do you want to hit it, LJ? Nah, I don't really want to hit it. Nah, let's let Tucker hit it. Tucker, what do you got on this one? And then he would just send some trick. And it was like really fun to to be a part of bringing him up in our sort of like mentality of like, just go get him. Were you guys like throwing him ideas? Like, hey, Tucker, try this. Oh, definitely. I mean, he was throwing ideas out, but we were definitely like, man, I don't want to do it. But you know what would be sick? If you did a backside 360 switch up on this and even like subtly doing it like, not to Tucker, like me and LJ would say it to each other, like, man, you know, would be really sick and like just some crazy trick. And yeah. eventually Tucker would do it. He's like one of the most gung ho tech rail skiers I've, I've ever met. And it was fun to get him out there and give him a chance to really throw down for like some urban stuff and definitely like more of a, like a production crew rather than going out with just his buddy or his girlfriend filming him. It was like two cameras on you, dude, the lights are on. And like, we might get busted by the cops at any moment. Like, let's see it. And 
he really excelled. He's got some some really great A heat in the new movie. Yeah, and you comparing him to LJ is I think it's really on point. Like there's a shot in the movie where he does a back swap to back swap to front to out. And I was seeing that and I was seeing LJ in level one 10 years ago. Yep, exactly. And he was like, and just wouldn't stop. And this is how LJ used to be. He's like wisened up a little when he gets tired. He knows like, okay, I got to stop or else I'm going to get hurt. And Tucker's like, just never gets tired. It's like, dude, it's dark. You've already got six tricks on this rail. Like that rail you're talking about, like he did other double switch up variations. And it was like, dude, we can't put all these in the movie. Like, which is the hardest one? Just try that one. Because honestly, if you do six of them, we're just going to have to like drop them on Instagram. Cause you can't like, it's just, yeah. you can't put that many shots in the movie, but he would just like, was just so in love with skiing and especially rails and urban skiing that it's like, well, I don't care if we, you don't even have to film it. I just kind of want to try this trick. It's like, what? Like if you're hitting urban, somebody better be filming because like, that's kind of the point. Just go hike a park rail like otherwise. But he's like, no, this is just like such a nice rail. Like if you guys want to pack up, I might just hike it a few more times for fun. Like you are so <laughs> LJ right now, Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> it was good also seeing you like you did a lot of you haven't lost the touch. Oh, thank you. That's too kind. I feel like I've I've layered down an, an, a lot. There's not 450s off everything, but. Well, you know what shot made me say? It, it's not this year, but there's a shot that made me say like, okay, Tom is just too good. It's in romance, which is still like, it, it's recent. It's two years ago. Mm -hmm. And you do a switch, kind of switch disaster, 450 on to switch. Like it's nothing. And I was like, okay, it's, it's, it's only a switch 450 on. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. That feature was kind of sick too. And it's funny being with Hornbeck and Phil on that trip. We're like, so old like wow why are we so old still doing this <laughs> and then by the end of the trip we're like oh yeah that's why like that was pretty dope but like the first day shoveling in the cold or like falling downstairs you're like why do we choose to do this and by the end you have such you know regard for it and you realize what it's all about once you have a couple clips and you have that stuff but yeah that's funny <laughs> what would you say was your um your favorite trick you got in the movie Uh, urban wise urban wise yeah uh that's tough i mean uh, i mean there's a couple really fun i mean the eye beam sort of like feature is probably one of my favorite this weird that weird spider like metal feature that i do the surface back swap on was probably one of my favorites just because like i love the find of unique features but Uh, there's a couple challenge like long rails in there that were really fun to do this year. Like one in Des Moines that we slid that me and Tucker both got that was like, I still to this day, like long kinked rails that are unique. Like, Oh, I've never hit an eight or a 10 kink rail with this little wiggle or that size kinks. It's like, it's always a learning process and it's like always a new rail and always something different. So That one rail is that one rail is intense. I don't remember how many kings, but it was I don't something around twelve. Like, I think it's eight, eight or ten, maybe. They're just long sections, but yeah, those ones are just like. And I'll tell you what was really fun this year. The shots aren't as standout, maybe from the trip, but I did get to to go to Pittsburgh and and ski some rails in the city of Pittsburgh where I grew up. So that was like maybe the shots aren't as amazing. There's like a six kink and like a super fed and some other random tricks in there that are all from Pennsylvania, but like it snowed a foot in P Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and I flew back and just like, so cool to like go to like some rails that I saw growing up, including that one, like really weird wall ride to like sort of jibby rail line feature at the beginning of the movie. And it's like something where like, I've looked at that double kink there at that school. It's like two minutes down the road from my house growing up. Like, I've known it was there for forever and it's like, I never got to hit it because there was never snow when I was there. And it's still like, it's just cool to get to go back there. And I got to ski in Pittsburgh and like grind some rails and like take some photos up in front of the skyline and be a part of like the city. And it just like felt kind of full circle from like growing up there, dreaming of get, you know, sliding some rail when I could barely slide rails on my skis. It was like, but that one would be cool. And to come back and go do some of that stuff after years and years of thinking about it was really, really rewarding. 
But yeah, as you said, you don't have the biggest tricks you've ever done, but a couple of shots there, you just have that wallish style where th there's a closeout where you do a switch on to switch, which is not, it's not the, the trick is not the point, but on that shot, you have that just wallish landing of just that style. And it's like, it makes the shot for me. Ah, uh, yeah. Stuff like that still. I mean, and it is like, yeah, maybe the tricks aren't the most technical. And even at that spot, I was trying to do like a back four out of the close over the closeout too. And like LJ or somebody was like, dude, fuck the back four switch to switch was heat. Like just go with that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of beat up. I, I had eaten shit into the closeout. I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I like to switch to switch. And that's, what's so cool. Like now being looking back on like a long career, it's like, I don't, I don't need to prove that I could do a back four out of a closeout. Like, I just love the aesthetics or the feeling of certain tricks or certain rails or certain spots. And like, I still just want to do it. One of the features in that urban edit that like I, I search for all year is that weird trash can feature where I grind up a rail, spin around, like not a spin. And I looked, oh my God, I must have spent hours and weeks driving around Salt Lake. Then when we were in Iowa, like everywhere I looked for a trash can that like was next to a rail or that would work like that or next to something. Cause I wanted to do a, not a spin on a trash can and finally found that one. And it was like that the trick is great when you see the shot, but like for me, it was like, Oh, this is it. LJ get, uh, get a shovel. We got to set this up. This is, I've been looking for this. And like, I had been looking for trash cans. I had a trash can in the back of the truck in case we found a rail. Like I, all I had on my mind was trash can for a lot of that year. Cause I wanted to do that trick and it finally worked out. And for me, those are the moments where you're like, ah, all the cards kind of come together and it's like, this is, this is it. Like, let's do it. And that's so cool. So you really had a vision for that. Yeah. I had, I mean, at one point I was, I had a trash can lid in the back of our truck. Cause I was like, I'll just find a place to like set it up. And then we found one that was perfect. And I was like, Oh shit. This is sick. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Daymaker Touring allows you to go touring without having to empty your wallet on new skis, boots, or bindings. The Daymaker Adapter allows you to enjoy all the fun touring has to offer with your traditional bindings without compromising on performance. If you're like me and you're the type who wants to go out touring a couple times a year, but doesn't want to spend all that money on a whole new kit, then Daymaker is for you. Daymakers cost at least 25% less than other touring bindings, are easy to use, durable, and offer the same performance, if not better, with their 4-bar linkage system. Also, if you go with Daymaker, you do not need to purchase new ski touring or walk mode boots. Your normal downhill ski boots will work perfectly. Check them out at daymakertouring.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Daymaker Touring. Yeah, like you said about not doing the best tricks, I had the same thing like filming with Belmar last season where we were hitting a rail where we could have done any trick. Like it, it's a smooth rail kind of, he could have done any trick. And he's so technical, he could do literally any switch up. He ended up just doing a super dope lip on back to, but just like clean, 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 clean. And we were like, yeah, that's good. Like, yeah. And same thing for him. Like he, he doesn't have to prove anyone that like he can do. Cause plus he did a super technical trick on that rail 12 years ago. So it was like, whatever. Yeah. That's my pro. Yeah. Going to all these features are like a down rail. It's like, man, I've done some crazy stuff on down rails. Like, do I do five switch ups on this one? Or do I do like a switch four on or do I just do something fun and that's why for me like I almost don't hit st stock or standard mm -hmm. features anymore or like down rails I just don't have a new trick it's finding like a new rail that keeps me coming back for urban like park you're never gonna find these weird curved rails like any rail with like a c or a curve like they never build them so like that's why I love finding urban rails or still searching for those urban rails because it's like yeah, maybe you've done a thousand K feds in your life, but have you done one on a down rail that kinks to the right and then curves and like finishes in an S? It's like, how cool is that? Like you never hit one like that before. And it's just like something new that keeps me coming back for more somehow at 34 and maybe two decades, I would say. I've, I've probably hit an urban rail at 14, probably been hitting handrails for 20 years. That's crazy. We're getting at that skate pro skateboarders level where, you know, they had long careers of, hitting street mm -hmm. where that's like you're kind of the first generation to do that of like having it that long it seems too long i probably should stop i mean 
somehow I choose to go film urban every year when my sponsors would be all well and happy if I snowmobiled all year and just film backcountry, which sounds so soft and smooth and fun. <laughs> A big part of your brand is related to that. Like people love seeing you do that. So as much as North Face doesn't care about street, let's say, but they care that you are known and liked. And that's what, you, you know, it's kind of a, oh, I yeah. feel like it's all related. And I couldn't stop doing rails. I mean, as much as I love ski and pow, ski and resorts, sledding, building jumps, like mm -hmm. rails are just like, I grew up doing, I'm a rail skier. Like I grew up in Pennsylvania. I, I, yeah. Pow is great, but man, there's just something so rewarding about rail skiing and the process and the tricks and the feeling that like, I'll, I'll never stop. I mean, I'm sure I'll stop hitting urban at some point. You have to, it's just way too much work, but man, I'll never stop going through the park and, and doing tricks on rails. It's just like, it's literally what I grew up doing and what I, all of what I've known my entire life. You saying that as a joke, I'm guessing like that you should stop hitting urban It, it leads me into something like, because you're involved in, in real ski. What were your thoughts when you saw Tanner going at it? Or I think you might have had a, had a role in inviting him like Tanner 37 hitting street. So cool. And he was hitting street the last couple of years too, which yeah. his diehard motivation for the sport is second to absolutely no one. Like there's no one that is more passionate more just excited about the sport than him and and just to see him still doing street and especially in that was like so cool and really like obviously there was like a lot of heat about the whole event and the lack of it being all street last year and everything and it was just like it's so tough like espn and this big corporation needs it to be something and really the way it worked out was the only way it was going to exist still as a competition. So for anybody listening, like, yeah, I wish it was all street too. I love that. I wish there was a street one and a backcountry one, but the way it happened with Tanner and everybody that was invited, the only way it was going to even exist as a real event, a real ski event was the way it happened. Otherwise it was going to be canceled. So the fact that it even happened, I'm so thankful for, and man, seeing somebody like Tanner in there, like, yeah, maybe like, the triple backflips a little just like something to do but man it's pretty damn sick to see him at his age doing a triple backflip and like yeah the 270 or some of his urban is like maybe not the most technical it's still like really cool and really unique spots and really fun to see him still doing it. and man i i was excited to see that full production come together that's something i had talked about a bit with lj last year and the fact that i think we're losing a bit or people are losing a bit the, the gratefulness or like the appreciation for those types of comps because ESPN has other fishes to fry. Like mm -hmm. they can make millions with the NFL. Like they don't have to put on a street comp. And there was a time when like Clayton Villa would get hundreds of thousands of views or you would get hundreds of thousands of views for a part. And nowadays it, it it's not like that. So it's my thoughts are just like, hey, be hyped on the content and You know, it's kind of a positive circle that you got to be put in because there's some some videos like, let's say, Phil's gold medal video gets 100,000 views, but a lot are not getting that much like traction. No. And it is like, it'd be cool if there was like an incredible core content or contest or if new schoolers put on their version of real ski with $100,000 for first and invited the right people. But like, that doesn't, it just, it's not fiscally or like, mm -hmm. it's not smart. Like it just wouldn't have the, the return on the investment that people are looking for. And that's, what's so tough is that like, we're struggling to keep this event core and meet guys like me and LJ and anybody else on, on the selection committee and like judging panel is trying so hard to keep it so core and so cool while somebody from above, like is obviously wants more views bigger stars, more social media following because it's all a business. They they don't care how sick somebody's full part was from last year that did something really steezy that no one's ever heard of. It's like I love that and I think that person deserves a a, a shot, but like it's just so hard to compete with like somebody that's huge and it's like we're trying our best and hopefully, I mean, hopefully it happens this year. I haven't heard anything yet, so we'll see, but I mean, it's just such a cool contest. And the fact that snowboarding had it for years before skiing is like, 
I'm always so jealous because, man, it's just like, think of all the other skiers we could have given an opportunity to. We could have gone through me and Hornbeck and Will Weston and Amet like in 2012. By now, we'd be on to so many more talented people that like deserve a shot. And it's so hard to like give everybody a shot in the event that really deserves one. Cause there is so much talent out there in street skiing and hopefully, hopefully it can go, go on for years to come. But like, ah, I don't know. And now it's time for a second sponsor break. Access board shop is a sponsor of the podcast once again, and I'm stoked to have them. They support dope athletes. They sponsor video projects and they put together the best events. They've been in business for close to 20 years and they're still passionate about everything skiing and snowboarding. Whatever you may need this season, they've got it. Skis, boots, bindings, clothing, outerwear, you name it. So if you're in Quebec, go check out their shop in saint Sauveur. If not, check them out online at accessboutique.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Axis Board Shop. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the first years, they were kind of playing catch-up to... Uh, inviting you and Hornbeck and Ahmed and Will where and JF, let's say, yeah. when you guys were still great and you were still relevant, but it was like, ah, why wasn't that like five years ago? Yeah, I that's what, I mean, it would have been so nice to get through, not to get through, but to have given us all an opportunity earlier so that we just would have more opportunities to get to the, the Lupes and the Hackles and the Magnuses that were like a little bit more fresh or whoever it is nowadays that's like, somebody from this zoot space crew or somebody that like deserves a chance but like it's just like there's so little room and as you said there's the business side where it's a hard thing to balance where you want to find the newest kid who's going to be great but at the same time you want to have also someone who's going to bring in the ratings yeah it's just tough because really like i mean picking all these people would be so easy if they all came out of movies but like you're saying like ski movies there's no opportunity anymore for these kids to like get invited to a level one shoot and film an urban segment. Or, I mean, I don't know, like this all social media now. And like, if you don't have a following on social media, it doesn't matter how good your full part was. because you won't be able to share your full part with anybody and like nobody will watch it. And it's just sad. I mean, I love social media for the fact that like it really democratized skiing. Like if you're an amazing skier and you live in Quebec or Pennsylvania, where I'm from, like, If you're posting bangers, you will get followers. Like it doesn't matter. Like when I was a kid, it's like I can't travel to any event. I have no way to even get my name out there. Say I filmed a great video clip. Internet's not really a thing. YouTube doesn't exist yet. Like how do I even show this to anybody? But now it's like if you're great and you're doing something so creative, so epic or so technical, like it'll get shared. It'll eventually make it to my explore page. And I'll probably repost it. So like that is really cool about social, but it also like it ruined the ski movie. Ski movies like don't matter anymore. I oh, I already saw that clip on Instagram a week ago. Why would I watch the movie? That's where it's really cool to see guys like you that are still involved. Like you're giving a chance to a guy like Tucker and uh, putting events like the the rail jam you did two years ago. That's ways to like give back some legitimacy or like some legitimate events. Yeah, that thing's coming back. We're coming back with a vengeance this year if all things go to plan. That was such a huge highlight for me, career highlight for sure. I mean, seeing a kid like Tucker like literally is what I was, like a tech rail skier that literally couldn't find a way to get known as a tech rail skier. Rail jams did exist when I was that young, but like didn't matter if you won a rail jam in Pennsylvania against Steve Stepp, like we were the only people doing it. Like it was hard to stand out and and for him to come through that whole qualifying process and get on a podium with literally olympic level x games gold medalist is like oh shit like this aspect of skiing is legit and even if you're not known you might be as good as some of the world's best so i'm hoping to come back bigger and better this year with a little bit more of an am friendly approachable event that'll be a little bit more open for everybody big prize money big features and and go big with it so you went really kind of uh the ambitious route you did a tv show you had real cash prizes like not a couple hundred bucks like there was real checks invited writers were treated super well Sick. um what's the roi not not the roi but like oh it, it loses money for sure we lost yeah money. <laughs> But like, is it like a passion project for you basically of like, you want to give back or do your sponsors find value in that? Like what's the, the behind the scenes of all putting that together? 
except from like a hall doing the biggest trick ever under the biggest pressure ever like hitting a home run bottom of the ninth bases loaded with like a full count like that's what that was and really i mean for me it is a passion project but at the same time anything i'm doing where i'm getting tv coverage and tons of live stream views and everybody posting about it from world-class skiers like that's huge benefit to my sponsors to me as an athlete like my name's involved in it so yeah i love when alex hall to his 100,000 followers says this event that at t wallish put on is so sick and hashtags like that's so impactful to me as a brand but overall like rails rail events didn't exist anymore and i was like this is bullshit like if i gotta do it myself i'm gonna do it And I basically, if I was going to do it, I wasn't going to half-ass it. So the first year was probably a little too big and I tried to do too much. And it's amazing to hear Alex say that because really the the resort was so kind, made everything so great, set everybody up, treated us to a huge dinner. We had like PT service, cash prizes, free lodging, like all these great things. But like I did too much. Like by the end of it, I was like so drained. I couldn't see straight. I couldn't think. I was like, I was stressed the whole time. It like was so exhausting that like in the future, I'll delegate a couple more of the duties. And probably the biggest critique was obviously that it wasn't open ended. It wasn't in, it was invite only. And there was a qualifier, but it wasn't really open. I'd love it to be like US Open of the past. Like, look, if you want to, if you want to compete and you think you're good enough, there'll be an entry fee, but like that just goes to more cash spread out bigger for a more qualifying rounds. And like, it just like, I always saw street league and saw like that format and that judging. It was like the biggest issue with rail events and rail jams was like, you might be killing it. If the judge looked away to like make a note and miss that one trick, like yeah. maybe you don't do well. And it's like, the jam format is so sick because it's so fun, but that's never how you're going to get the real winner. So I was like, how do we figure this out? And I think the format was amazing because really like, yeah, you can't try everything you wanted to try, but like at the end of the day, the person that did the best tricks is going to win. The judges are actually going to see it. It's going to get scored appropriately. It's still fun and approachable. And just like, I think we need more of that because rails, like I was saying, like there was kids that made the finals that like I had heard of, but like, you know, kids like Tucker or uh, Jackson Carstetter and these kids from like Midwest resorts that are like small hill kill- kids that like you're so good at rails and maybe like you're never going to be in the X Games against Alex Hall, but like you have a chance to take him down right now on something that like he, he's pretty damn good at too, but you might be better. And that's just so cool. So I, I really am hoping to do it again. I mean, it is a passion project, but it's just so fun to be a part of and to see that, that joy and excitement and to have that opportunity for kids. Like there were some opportunities when I was a kid and there's nothing now. So like I refuse to, to let it go that way. And props to you for doing it. Cause it's, as you said, it's something that's been lost and it's, it's super great. Cause, uh, I, I had a lot of friends from Quebec who were really good, but you know, we're looking for that chance to prove themselves and rails to riches and uh, water of rails were those times like okay i'm signing up and i'm i want to compete with wallish and show them that i'm up there with wallish at war of rails and they probably are like there's so much talent on rails and it's really like it's a level playing field because no matter how small or shitty your resort is per se like you could be really good at rails like it's the one thing that like you can't mess up a down rail like if the lip sucks like you can always go rebuild it yourself like Mm -hmm you can't make a good jump. You just can't hand, hand build a real, a good jump. So it's like, I just love that about rails. And there's probably those same kids that like showed up and still whoop me at war of rails, or at least like made me like hustle for a W it's like, where did, where'd this kid come from? Like, he's so good. Like he's running up the hill and he's doing harder tricks. Like I got to hustle. And that's, what's so cool about rails, man. Oh, I've always loved it. Maybe you have some insight from insights from behind the scenes with sponsors and everything, but it seems like, well, every like in-person event that is not fist related has died. Like War of Rails doesn't exist. Rails to Riches, uh, Simon Dumont used to do his event. It doesn't exist. Um, you know, Sin, who used to do his own events, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. Do you think that, do you think there's still something there or we're just living we're, like it's another era? It's tough to say. I mean, I guess it's, it really seems like it just 
isn't there anymore. But I don't think it's a matter of like sponsors don't want to sponsor it. I think like if there's a good idea and I saw it with my event, like I thought it was a great idea and I was able to fund it with like money from just my sponsors, not really even like other brands or non-endemic brands. But I think it's just like, it needs passion. It needs somebody to run it. Like it's running the event and, and working that like, obviously like I didn't get paid. My agent didn't get paid. Uh, everybody else that like ran the live stream and everything else got paid. The resort definitely didn't make money. And like, nobody wants to work for free. And unless you find a resort that's willing to work with you and people that are willing to like do all that work planning for like very low cost or, or no fee, like there's just not money in it. So that's why maybe those all died out. And I worry that like all the resorts that would have them are now owned by a massive conglomerate that just sees an event like that. Like, yeah, maybe it's great publicity, but like, we're just going to lose money. Nah, we're not going to do it. We don't need it. We build a park good enough. And seven Springs, bless them were so cool because they spent way too much money and hooked it up for so much. And like the benefit is just that they get pro skiers coming to their mountain, but really, I mean, it's just so cool. Everything they did for us. You're right. That maybe for, uh, this big conglomerate, it's just the spending sheet. They just see the the spending and they're like, "Mm." it's just an accountant, you know, like being, Nope. They're looking at a. They're definitely looking at a balance sheet and and income statement. And they're like, no, it doesn't matter. You know, we won't name names. You know, the big corporations. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's time for another sponsor break. I'm stoked to have Planks Clothing as a sponsor again this year. I love the brand. Everything they make is top quality and super stylish. Planks has just launched their new No Skiing on Mars capsule collection. The No Skiing on Mars collection is a collaboration between Protect Our Winters UK, also known as PAL, and Planks Clothing. With the sales of this limited collection made from recycled fabrics, they aim to raise over 5,000 euros. This donation will help fund PAL's carbon literacy program, which is already changing individual and businesses' carbon consumption for the better. Mars may be the next frontier for human settlement, but it sucks as a ski destination. Our Earth is amazing and we must help protect it. No skiing on Mars is available to shop now at planksclothing.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Planks Clothing. Yeah, and I remember seeing that. Like, there used to be one big event in Quebec back when I was young and it was basically there was 50,000 people going to the hill and like it was reaching like a broader audience but it was I found out like okay basically that big um, company non-endemic that's putting the money well as soon as they weren't down with it it died Yeah, and it was the same thing I think with WSI you know how big it was in Whistler and as soon as like the big companies were out it's like well that's it how are they how are they going to fund it Oh man, that was such a sick one too. And like, I mean, there's always been cool stuff in Quebec from like, what's the, what's the video challenge one where they had like the Coors Light challenge. Yeah. I guess it was run by Coors Light. There's the brand yeah, there, yeah. but like stuff like that. I mean, and there, I think there's room for all those good ideas that aren't fists that could be some sort of great event, but really it needs, it needs the support of a crew and like a non-endemic or at least a really good sponsor to put the money behind it. And Hopefully we get more of that and more things like not necessarily that every rider has to do it, but if more people are passionate about whatever aspect, like we need more professional skiers in say the twilight of our careers, like me to like, you know, give back. It's so cool. We need more Tanner Hall invitationals and Henrik and Phil B and E's like we need those, like we need those athletes to be the one that step up like those guys have done. And we need passionate people like you that that want to give back because the Coors Light Challenge was the same thing. It was a super cool contest where there was a kind of good cash prize. Yeah. And as soon as Coors Light was out, then it, it died. And Axis, who's um, the, the board shop in Quebec, that was one of the sponsors, were like, okay, we, we can't let it die. And they brought it back saying like, fuck it, we'll, we'll, break. we'll, we'll pay like even though like Coors Light isn't in it, but it needs to happen. Damn. So yeah, that's cool. And that's how it needs to be, but it is like it's all a passion project and it's it sucks that all all these cool events are when like FIS is like the only route that a lot of these younger kids see. They're like, "Well, I know I already see the World Cup schedule. Like I got to try to get into that cuz like who knows? Like it's not like my event for next year is on any schedule yet. It's still hopefully getting planned, you know? It's like that World Cup schedule is already set. Like I guess I can at least show that to my mom and convince her to let me go to something like it it needs to be tangible it needs to be attainable and that's the only thing that's like 
guaranteed. It's that there will be a World Cup or a NORAM or whatever it is, which is great, but it, it sucks for the variety. There's no like chance for it to be different. We, we talked a bit about Quebec and about um, you know that whole scene. There's a story I need to share with you, and I want your thoughts after that because you're one of the guys who who is the most influential, I think, in the past like 15 years with Walt, with Enric, Tanner, and Phil. I don't think there's anyone other than you four that's, that's been that influential. And what's crazy for you is how you made it quick. Like there's guys like Hale, A-Hall or Colby Stevenson that are big now, but it took like five years to build up. And I remember uh, you came in 09 to, to Quebec for a level one shoot. And you took a day off with the crew to ride at the at Avila. Yeah. And, and I remember seeing you ride and you had a hundred kids chasing you. Like you were taking laps and maybe maybe that happens to you everywhere you go. I don't know. But I have that memory of like, holy shit. I Having like, you know, uh, you see comments online, you see views online, but then you see it in real person where like the word got passed on, like Tom Wallish is in town. We got to see him. Oh, it was so cool. That day there was like a contest too. And Phil had like talked to the, to the shop and we got these sick jerseys made that everybody was getting, but we didn't compete, but we had these sick basketball jerseys with our last names on them that they made and like skiing that day. I mean, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but like for a while, like every, every time I went to a new resort in like a, a far away place, like Quebec where it was unexpected or when we would ski in Finland hitting urban and go to the local resort it was like yeah like du little ducklings following a duck which is so intimidating like if I eat shit on like a rail slide out of nowhere because I caught an edge like I don't want a hundred people to laugh at me and that was basically the pressure but so cool and so like oh my god it's such a cool feeling like the amount of love from the, the Quebec ski community. And especially that whole day at that event was like, I mean, me, Phil, and I think it was Corey Vanular with us. were just like lap in the park. And it was like, this is insane. Like the kids are going nuts and the love and like appreciation for like, what are you guys filming for? Oh, I love the movie. I watch this. I always watch that. Like those comments literally never, never get old. And it's absolutely the most gratifying and thankful and like, amazing thing to hear and yeah it's really cool i mean i i gotta come back and visit that was uh, that was years ago that's probably yeah oh nine ten years ago oh and it was so fun though that park was actually really good and just like the street stuff around that area is just ah oh, so fun my whole urban life i've never like 99 has been like in between montreal and that hill like in that radius and it's just like there's infinite stuff oh Sounds easy. I mean, there is like all, there's a lot of stuff, say, in Salt Lake City within an hour, but like, yeah, there's lots of stuff in Denver. That's like seven hours away. There's lots of stuff in Minneapolis. That's 20 hours away. Like, we drive so far. Yeah, you guys have, have a lot of choice. It's, I guess it's more that we got to deal with what we have because if we go eastbound, there's not really much. And if we go westbound, then it's Nothing. Ontario and there's not snow. So, Hey, you get out to Regina or something. There might be snow in Saskatchewan. I don't know. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that that's the way it goes in Canada. Like, if you go in Vancouver, there's no snow. No. If you go in uh, in Ottawa or Toronto, there's rarely snow. R very rare. So it's like Montreal, Quebec. Yeah, the two. But yeah, that that event was crazy to see. Um, that's so funny. the love. And I realized afterwards seeing Phil ride the park. Because I always saw Phil riding the park and I was like, he rides so fast. He's like one hit to another to another and he's gone. And then I was like, oh, that's why. Because <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't stop because you're, you're going to get eaten alive. Yeah, kind of. Especially at that time. I feel like now it's more like everybody's more approachable maybe with social media and like people see a lot of stuff. But like when it was just ski movies, for the most part, it was like, holy shit, like I watched that segment a hundred times, but like, I don't really know what that person looks like or what they normally do. Like, it was like more like had more of an aura around it where now you see like, if you follow me or Phil or whatever, you might see an Insta story every day of what they ate for breakfast, how their dog looks, what they do, like them doing whatever. And it's like, you maybe like get to know them a little bit more when in person back in the day, it was like, oh, I've only ever known Pep Fujas from his segments. Like there he is in the flesh, like, holy shit. It just was like more astounding maybe. 
I don't remember what it was exactly, but you talked about being intimidated or maybe other people when you were first into shoots. I think you might have had that a lot. I remember Alex telling me he went to Japan and like, he was like, damn, I'm in a hotel room with Tom Wallish. Like, oh, fuck. <laughs> As a person, but just like there's the high icon of skiing and like, okay, I'm, I'm there. I made it. Okay. That's so funny. And that's how it is. And, and that's what's so cool about action sports. I feel like it goes like in waves like that, like the same person that feels like the underdog and has to prove themselves slowly becomes the older dog who has to like, I don't know, at least lead the right example or like keep up or then like at least, you know, teach or bring somebody along or give a hand hand up to somebody. And it's just like, it's so cool how it works in stages like that. And each part of your like path through it is like helping somebody or like being helped by somebody. And it's just so cool to like receive that help and then also be able to give back. It gets the opportunity for a really cool mentorship. A bit like you with Tucker where like, yeah. there's a lot of those cool stuff right now where like old pros are becoming coaches, let's say. So many. Where like JF Hool is coaching the the young Quebec guys of Team Quebec. And it's like, if you have JF Hool as a coach and mentor, you're pretty lucky. Like you're you're getting good advice. Yeah, like you know how many X games he's been at the top of? Like, I mean, the kids he's coaching maybe can do tricks that he's never done or I we've never done. But like, he'll tell you exactly what it feels like to have one run left, X games, teens gold medal on the line and like to succeed and like what he thought how he did it how he treated sponsorship deals how he treated the press or media or there's just so much to learn and i love it's really cool to see how many like from jf to tj and even like kusan still and like all these guys like there's so much passion the skogans of the world like there's so much passion and the sport is still full of so many talented skiers from different generations now on a coaching side and like to make one comment on the olympics or fists or any of these things like it it does suck it being so organized but like without the olympics or without fists like there's so many of my friends and so many of these legendary pros and skiers that wouldn't have a job in skiing they would have to do something else so like Thank the Lord for that, to see somebody like JF be able to travel the world still, ski, expand, spread his knowledge with the youth, like without like teams and all these things that we think are pretty gimmicky, like national teams and FIS and Olympics. It's like without that, like there'd be no opportunity for like some of my best friends to still be out literally doing what they love and sharing what they love with people younger than them. Like it's so cool to see. Yeah, you're right. It's kind of a silver lining. Because as much as there is a downside, as you said, there's that side of like, it's not a boomer guy, like racing that, teaching them. No. It's, it's actual legend. So we're kind of pass, still passing the torch in terms of values and culture. Culture. I mean, it does suck. I do hate that like some of my best memories from competing were like getting to meet people from other countries and me and Henrik sharing a room at a competition or me and Russ Hedshaw doing something together and then going to a shoot afterward. It's like, you don't do anything with any other nationalities. You're like all on national teams. And it's like, it's just sad that like the international relationships that skiing fostered in all of us have kind of like, I, they still exist and stuff, but like it used to be so cool. Like it was a gathering of like people from all the countries that like would just live and travel together and be like so interconnected that you learned things about Swedish customs or visit somebody's family and have a home cooked meal. Like there was so much more like worldly, like travel to it that, that I just feel like the kids are, are missing out on. You're right. because some of the most legendary, like duos or team ups, like let's say you think of Phil and Henrik, you might not have Phil and Henrik if they're both in their national team headquarters and training camps. And they, they met through yeah. like just blending up and then it created something big. True. Yeah, that's exactly what you miss out on. I mean, you maybe, yeah, I just don't think you'd get that anymore almost. It is like, it's those like authentic friendships that are joined from like traveling together rather than being like, as much as I, I love the coaches and it's great for them. It's like, if you're only ever traveling with that person, you're never going to meet the other people or get to know them on like a non-ski, non-sport way and, and cr cultivate those relationships. You were a guy, I've always been curious on that point. You've been a guy who got onto the scene, 
you you got to dominate competitions from like 2010 to 2013 you were basically winning a lot of stuff and then the whole shit show with the olympics happened with your knee with like it looked like a terrible time for everyone do you miss competitions like how do you look back on that no definitely not i mean i looking back on it i think it was perfect i mean i almost wish i would have gotten into it sooner like it was so hard being like a rail guy and like just doing like the edits like it was so hard to get an invite to like a big event and i think i could have like not definitely not won events but i think it would have been awesome to have like some of those younger years when i was like 19 and 20 like competing and getting 15th and maybe making a finals but like it really like i would have loved to compete then because the best part about competitions for me was traveling to the best parks in the world. Like literally every week was a world-class slope style park. Like that's awesome. And I learned half my tricks or improved on half of my tricks on these jumps that were like built to perfection. And then by the end of it, like, I mean, I was still like maybe keeping up, but one of my biggest things when I stopped competing is it took me so long to get into those events. Cause there was people still holding on and getting like 13th in an event they knew they couldn't win and just competing just to like do it for their sponsor that wanted them to compete. And it took me so long to break in because a couple people wouldn't just step out. So like as soon as I was like at an event and I was like, I don't think I can win. And then I was like, oh, if you can't win, like get the fuck out. Like there's some other kid that thinks he can win that can't get in that you're taking his spot. You didn't want to be that guy. I refuse to be that guy. I remember what it felt like. Like I would have loved to compete in the do tour or the X games a year or two before I ever got invited, but like there was not room. So as soon as I felt like I didn't have the passion to go out and learn whatever the trick was or to try whatever the hardest run was to win that day. And I was sort of like for like a year after my knee surgery, I came back and I would go to the events and I, I was like, man, I would love to win, but like, I don't think I want to try that hard. Like, Oh shit. I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of it. And I, I just figured the quicker you get out of it, the more opportunity you give somebody else. And I've always been more in love with filming as much as I love competing. And as much as I love like showing off my skills or beating people and being competitive, like it's just so much more fun for me to compile something that comes together and that lives longer than, I mean, we, I, I can't remember who was on the podium with me at events in 2012, but I remember every shot in that segment from that year or something, you know, every moment. Cause there's just so much more that goes into some of these film moments than like that one run where you did good. And you're like, Oh shit, that just happened. Like they're almost forgettable. I mean, those memories are, are amazing, but like the segments live on forever and can be watched for forever. And there's something to say about that. You're right. And I think that leads back to what you were saying earlier about your sponsors, not caring about street. And that was my point of saying like, yeah, yeah, it's more direct exposure competition or like another thing, but your legend is built upon the street shots or the, your shots in general, let's say where I, when I think of you, I think of the super unknown. I think of the refresh segment. I think of, you know, many things, not necessarily. Yeah. I have in mind your, your gold medal, uh, at night at X games, but is that what stands out? Maybe for some, but a big part of your legend is built upon the films. Yeah. And I love that. It's so cool. And not that I, I think that I think my sponsors, yeah, do care about the urban, but man, it could be a real cushy life to just like maybe go on a couple cat skiing trips and just kind of relax. But something about the grind of urban that like, it's, it's so rewarding for how much work you put in. And it's so cool to see it all come together. I, I keep saying I should just stop doing it. It's way too much work. Usually every time I fall down a stair set and like I'm all beat up at the end of the day, I'm like, I should really stop doing this, but we'll see. Probably never will. How did it go for you uh, last year? Did you get banged up a bit or did it go smoothly? Uh, pretty smoothly. Yeah. I mean, I feel like everything for the most part healthy, but just like the grind, literally the grind to be punny of urban is like more than just like I'm smarter about how I set features up now and what I hit and don't hit but like shoveling is so hard on your back the hours the travel the amount of time in the car and then to get out cold and put your ski boots and your knee brace on and try to warm up for a feature and then carry the winch out somewhere really far away it's like there's so much effort and work that it's like 
at some point you start to think like, hmm, should have just done a GoPro follow through the park for Instagram and it probably would have got more hits than this clip. But like at the same point, there's something to be said about working for it that, you know, makes it worth it. The age old expression, you can't have the sweet without the sour. So you need to like, you need to work for it for that clip to matter. And it just makes it that much more enjoyable to get it afterward. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you kind of have that bad and that negative side that comes with your big following. It's like, if someone is relatively unknown, he will get more sh more views out of his street part because that's special. True. But with your following, you know that the GoPro shot will do it. I should only do GoPro shots at Park City and Mammoth and Woodward and just hit jumps and do cork sev blunts. And it'd probably be like a great career. But man, finding a street feature that's perfect to spin around on a trash can lid is pretty cool too. <laughs> There's a random thing that I wanted to tell you, but it made me laugh so much. I was rewatching, I think it's the first year you did Good Company. You see a random character called Paul Mendel, and the guy is hanging out with you, and it's just funny. And then you, in the credits, it's a voicemail from him that you guys received. And it's like, hey guys, don't forget to put me in the credits. I'd really like it. Put me in the credits. And that whole encounter is just so funny. Like, how do you look back on that situation or just like, characters that you meet in the streets in general like i mean urban skiing introduces you to some characters because obviously you meet like people that have never seen skiing and you're in a lot of cities that maybe are like uh, you know underserved or like people have never seen that type of a sport or they've never seen action sports and they're so confused and like the back and forth dialogue is so funny like that guy was the best accent the most fun interesting like excited guy And like everything about it is just so cool. Like we were having not, not a bad time at that rail, but like we were sessioning that rail and it ended up not being as trickable or it wasn't what we wanted for some reason. And it went from like, ah, shit, I don't know if we can get a shot on this. Like it, I don't have something for it to like, oh shit, let's hit it again. This guy, let's hit it together. This guy's so psyched. And like, it's those moments with people that like make it so much more fun i guess and hopefully we're showcasing skiing to the right people but man it's just like it's just so funny like his whole interaction was like incredible <laughs> when you say you were hitting it together that's when you hit it with mcchesney and you end up getting yeah. a back floor out yeah <laughs> that's crazy we were like just hitting it in a train i don't know why we thought it'd be funny if we grinded it in a row like you can just tell like we weren't vibing the feature or maybe we were tired it was the end of the trip we didn't have like that like attitude to try something crazy but then getting that like we were doing it i think tim got it once to like back two or back four with me missing it and we, we were like why are we doing this together like we ruined the shot but like who cares or whatever it was just yeah funny. no one cares no one cares to this day i don't think anybody's up in arms about it yeah exactly <laughs> it's like we put ourselves through like on on official rules or like on i don't know how you say that but like rules that just don't exist Yeah, like, I need to be alone hitting it. It's like, well, why not be the two of you? Yeah, or yeah, whatever it is. You got to build the jump on this side. You got to shovel the stairs a certain way. Like there's so many rules that like, yeah, it matters. But like in the end, or we always used to joke like, oh, you built the jump too high or you built it a stair down or you gapped onto it when you didn't need to. It's like, ah, whatever. It's just skiing. Like here's the location. Here's a pin. Go do it the way you want to do it. I don't care. Personally, I always kind of feel weird when I see unshoveled stairs. That just that's just my Frank Raymond hub bringing. Where yeah. I'm like, no, you ah, there's something wrong there. You got a shoveled stairs. Yeah, but other than that, whatever floats your boat. Yeah, I just like I know there's times where probably in Quebec where like it's March and the stairs or whatever. Maybe it rained recently. It's ice. You want me to spend six hours shoveling these? Like I'll shovel them if it's a block of ice. Like and I just want to do a rail slide too bad today they're not getting shoveled like i get it if it's really hard yeah who cares? that might have happened to me last year where we were like nope it's too icy not doing it i mean you could just wait and hit it once it's a warmer day i guess but it's just one of those things where like personal preference i mean i love the aesthetics of a perfectly shoveled staircase but like if it's too hard to do and you're just trying to do it for fun like not all of these things have to be for the cover of a magazine or the closing part in a video like it should be fun. We shouldn't put these like gates and barriers on people for anything, especially urban skiing. Like it should be as easy as possible. You can't hate on somebody for the way they did it. Like just either enjoy it for what it is or move to the next. Don't, uh, we don't need to cut them down for it. 
couple quick questions for you because yeah. um, I guess those those are always fun to know. You've done segments with 4x9, with Level 1, with TGR, with Matchstick, with Sherpas, with fucking everyone. Who would you say was like the company that you've had the best time with or like that was the most fun? <laughs> Is, th is there one that stands out? Because I guess it's hard because like 4x9 were like your best friends. and Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, 4x9 obviously was probably the most fun. And still to this day, AJ, who filmed a lot of the 4x9 stuff along with Andrew Napier, is still my best friend and, and filming all the good company stuff. So that one like lasted the longest. And then it's hard to say because Field was like the most unique experience. Like I got to go to Norway 10, 20 times to film with them. And that's like so cool to have best friends in a foreign country worlds away culturally from what I grew up with and to like meet them, their families, how it all worked. And then Sherpas, like a crew that I put like three weeks to filming imagination with like no sleep, so much work, like the most direst of wet, rainy, shitty conditions to make like an unforgettable project. Like there are memories with all these crews that make them like unrelatable to the other ones. Cause it's just like you go to battle together for these things. And really they all level one from the days with Kyle and Friedel and Josh, like everything's been so fun. So it, it really is hard to like yeah. pick and choose. And if I had to say like, just having that variety, like I always used to think, man, I wish I would have done Wallace project sooner and like put all my footage into one segment. Cause maybe it would have been that much better of a segment, but like, I can't take back how fun and how cool each segment was from each of those film crews. And in hindsight, I needed to, I, I'm so happy I spread my time so thin because it built all these awesome memories, relationships and segments that like things that I'll never forget. Yeah. My question was unfair. Cause like just in the, the answer you gave, there's like a whole podcast episode of just talking <laughs> about those, those things. Okay. Then one that relates to what you just said, what would you say would be your segment that stands the tallest? Like that would be your Clayton Villa mutiny segment. Like, Oh man, that's tough. I mean, really it's probably gotta be just Wallish project. Cause it was like the first year I like put everything into one area. And what people kind of forget is that same year I filmed an into the mind segment with JP Claire for Sherpa's movie. So it really wasn't even just I did two segments that year still, even trying to only do one and like competing that year. Like I still went one world champs and competed in all the X games, like got a couple results at do tour. And then to film that whole video of like urban and backcountry and park was like, I mean, that's, that's my biggest, best memory. But at the same point, like refresh that year is probably something I'll never forget that segment with that song. With that crew. That song, like Talib's one of my favorite hip hop artists of all time. And just that whole year we filmed, like it was like me, Amet, Hornbeck, Phil, Casabon, Delorum. It was like the grade A skiers of the time and still to this day. And it was just like something like, oh man, that like coming together that year was something I'll never forget. So Refresh and Wallace Project are the two that'll live on with me for forever. Dope. Yeah. Refresh was something special because... You blew up onto the scene in 07. In 08, you were kind of stating like, yeah, I'm one of the best. But I feel like Refresh was like, plus with that song and like that that vibe, it was like, he's the king. Like that was yeah. like the, the the end of the the climb up. And that was like, yeah, it's Wallish. It's Ah, that was so fun. Take yeah. me back to those days. On my side, I took notes of all your segments. I my way was like, if there's a trick that stands out that I'm like, oh, that's a banger, I take note. And the one that I took the more notes were I trip. Ah, huh. there was it, it, this segment was kind of split in two of like uh, first first part was like shots all around, and then second part was Finland Street. Yeah, of only you. I didn't remember that segment that well, but looking back at it, I was like, "That's a banger! That's a banger! That's a banger!" It was like nonstop. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think I was injured for some of that year. And then also competed all year. So that was like a really hard year for getting a lot of shots. But that was like me and my prime of technicality. Like every every rail trip was like, what's a trick that's never been done on a rail? I'm, I, that's what I want to try. And that's kind of like the tip I was on at that stage. Yeah, that was the year of the, hey, Tom, what do you have to say to someone who wants to come back? Don't. I mean, honestly, you should go back. That rail is perfect. Natural in-run. And yeah, hopefully not. Is it Salt Lake? No, that one's in Minnesota. 
Harding, Harding High School or middle school. Harding is the name of the school, but it's just such a perfect rail that like everybody should go hit it. But that was, you know, a little arrogant, you know, after getting a clip, you felt pretty hype, but no, but it was funny. <laughs> and plus like four on, not disaster, four on to the first kink, uh, to the first down, but that's all time. It was, I was hyped on, I mean, I wanted to do that trick all year. I even just wanted to do on, do a down rail. But as soon as we got there, I was like, this is the spot for it. And I remember Liam Downey with us was with us and it, it didn't take me that long. And he was like, what the fuck? He was like pissed at me. He was like, this is so fucked up. Like you just did that in like 15 tries. Like I, I, I'm so mad at you, like happy for me, but like so upset of how crazy I was getting. He's like, I don't want to hit urban if you're going to keep doing shit like this. Yeah. And plus I think he was kind of maybe in the end of his career a bit. So like, You were, you had your name at that point, but still like, okay, that's what I'm up to. Okay. That, that's what I was thinking all year with Tucker. He just wouldn't stop doing backside 360 switch ups and everything. I was like, relax, dude. I'm trying to get a clip too. Save something for me. <laughs> LJ did his LJ stuff, Classic. which is like, yeah, LJ. And then you and Tucker did your thing. It's, it's a dope movie. I'm stoked on it. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited for the world to get to see it. I mean, it's just cool to still get to make a movie with urban and backcountry because something I think that's lost these days is like everything's like, oh, it's a street movie or it's a backcountry movie or it's a, a park edit. Like ski movies for the years I was a child, everything I watched, like every segment had both aspects or all three or a competition footage, park footage, urban footage, a clip in the half pipe and a backcountry jump. Like why can't we be Why can't people do everything? Like, that's the thing I respect the most is somebody that can do it all. And I wish more people would step out of their comfort zone and do a little bit of everything. And it's cool to see. I think the one that reminds me most of you in the younger generation is A-Hall. Yeah. Where like, he'll go in the street, go in the park. Like he gets a medal at X Games, but then goes and goes on a street trip and does insane stuff. Yeah. I mean, his real ski video this year and like urban segments in the past and like everything and then still goes and wins X Games or films like literally an edit on a picnic table like he's a member of the bunch like he can do it all. And like definitely a kid that I watched grow up and like, yeah, this one's got it. He he, I, I like his attitude. He won't stop skiing. He won't take days off. He'll ski from nine to four. I'm like, shit, he's a little too much like me. This kid is like taking over. I got to watch my job. Thanks for coming on, Tom. I of really course. appreciate it. it was yeah. really good talking to you. That was so fun. Thanks for the time. I'm happy to happy to chat. Hopefully anybody that stuck around listening this long was entertained and interested enough and we'll have to continue the conversation some other time. Yeah, I'm sure people will be. It was super good. Really glad. Hell yeah, man. Thanks for the time. That was so fun. So this is it for episode 22. I really hope you enjoyed it. On my part, I really enjoyed talking with Tom. Big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Daymaker Touring, Axis Board Shop, and Planks Clothing. Also, as I've said at the beginning of the podcast, go check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Podcast. It's a great spot to support the podcast. By becoming a patron, you'll get shoutouts and episodes, entries and exclusive monthly raffles from sponsors, and even the chance to ask a question to a future guest. Peace. Peace.